Beautiful. What an honor and privilege it is to be in the presence of men and women who know how to worship Jesus. It is wonderful. But yes, Pastor Danny is gone today, and he asked if I would step in. And um, my name is Pastor Luke, as you are well aware, I guess. And um, so I am the lead pastor of Nexus Church, as you, many of you know, some of you don't. And uh, I am in Thief River Falls, and most of you were able to uh, come and check our church out back when we launched you guys, which seems like forever ago, but it was just a few months ago in April. And um, so Dan asked if I could come, and lo and behold, I got somebody to cover for me in Thief River Falls, and so I was able to come and uh, worship with you guys today. I brought with me a wonderful trailer full of archery supplies so we are hoping that uh, this Tuesday you get some people that are going to come and do some fun ministry opportunity, a free event for archery, and it is loaded. So we have the opportunity to have potentially up to 30 people shooting archery bows, and we have five targets, nice backdrops, so it's just waiting for some kids and maybe their parents to come and check it out. Um, this week also, I know that there is a, um, a revival service happening and uh, led by Bill Stanton at the Church of God in Christ. I try to look all over online to find some information on it. Um, if it's anything like Thief River, because he's coming to us the following week, uh, it's going to be Wednesday and Thursday in the evening there. So, um, But if you can figure out how to uh, get a hold of Church of God in Christ, call them up. Church of God. Church of God, not in Christ. Okay. Okay. Oh, wow. So you guys got a long one. And he's the one, isn't he the one that had uh, up in Minnesota there, they've been having the Bible fire revivals over there? Um, I know he's been at Josiah Center, which is in Minneapolis area. I know he's been there. So um, he's not anymore in, he's not located in Minnesota anymore. Uh, he's now moved to Texas, I think, somewhere down south, but anyhow, he's a, he's a massive revivalist, has been around for quite a while. I know our people in Thief River got really excited when they heard he's coming, so a uh, pretty popular guy, very filled with the spirit. You're going to see some pretty cool things happening. So that's just a few things going on. So the next few Tuesdays, uh, we're going to have some archery going on here in the church lot, and uh, pretty excited about that. So today, I'm just going to uh, <coughs> cover, I should see what time it is so I don't go too crazy on you guys. Perfect, 11.23. That gives me a, you know, a good half hour to preach for you today before it gets uh, noon and you guys are thinking about food and you don't want to listen to me anymore. So I'm going to share, uh, man, one of my favorite books in the Bible. Uh, I, I started our church on Acts last summer, and I spent the whole summer covering the book of Acts. I only got to chapter 8. That's how much I like Acts. And so we got through chapter 8, and um, talking about Saul in chapter 8. And so today, if you know anything about Saul, who turned to Paul, we're going to talk about his encounter. Now, many times we get caught up in Saul's encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, and we kind of blow past a really important man who also had an encounter with God, and that is Ananias. Ananias had an encounter with God, and if it wasn't for his encounter with God, we wouldn't have Paul today. He'd still be Saul. So that was a very important time. And so I begin uh, this message by just simply asking a question. How many of you have experienced all God has for you. I don't care if you're brand new in Christ or if you've been living for Jesus for a long time. Until we meet Jesus face to face, I don't think we're ever going to be completely experiencing all that God has for us because, of course, we look towards heaven. And that's okay that we all have a long ways to go with our walk with Jesus. There's nothing wrong with that. That is okay. Here's the thing that I want to encourage you with today. It's that the fact that it's not okay 
being content with where we're at. We need to keep pressing into God, and we're going to see an example of that today with the story of Saul and specifically Ananias. And I believe that an encounter with God will transform not only your world, but the world of the people around you. So we're going to begin by reading Acts chapter 9, verse 1. Um, we're going to read just a few verses. We're going to stop. We're going to talk about Saul for a little bit because I think we all have Saul's in our life that need a radical encounter with God. We're going to talk about how we need to encounter God, and many of us have, what that's done for us, but then we're going to pick it up with Ananias after that, and we'll talk about him. So we'll start with Saul, and then we'll hit Ananias after that, and then we'll all wrap it together for our life today. So verse 1 of chapter 9 in the book of Acts. But Saul was still breathing threats of murder against the disciples of the Lord, and he went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus. So if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, who you are persecuting, but rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Father, I thank you for your word, and as we dig into it today, God, I pray that you will open up our eyes, you'll open up our heart, and you'll strengthen our feet and our hands to do as we read in your word today. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. <laughs> so Saul had an encounter with God. The text begins by saying he was breathing threats. And murder. Okay, before this, uh, we read in chapter 8 that Saul was ravaging the churches. In fact, uh, we know that he was there when Philip and Simon were being killed. And so as Stephen was being stoned, he was holding the garments as people were throwing stones at him. And he was ravaging the churches, taking out anybody who was followers of the way. But it got me wondering, why would a person... Be so filled with anger. What would cause this man who I think of, I mean, when I think of somebody like Saul, I think of like an Adolf Hitler who was just so passionate that he was willing to, to destroy anybody who was of a certain belief system. What would cause somebody? Now, of course, for Hitler, he just had a passion to kill all the Jews. Saul, there was a, I think there was, an, there was an underlying reason now, we know from history that during this time, the Romans were ruling Jerusalem, right? That, that all of Israel was being Rome by, ruled by Rome. Say that ten times fast. <laughs> and so there was already this sense of fear in Israel, that there was, there was nothing for them to hold on to. There was no control. Everybody around them was controlling them. And in fact, they thought Jesus, the Messiah, was going to be this one who would free them from Rome. And now, this one who they turned their backs on, who they obviously realized he wasn't going to rule on this earth. He was going to rule in heaven. Now, every day, thousands of people are turning to this now dead man and following him. So we have all these Jewish people leaving the Jewish faith, following the way, as the Bible calls it here. So we're being ruled by an outside authority. All of the people who we have in our kind of neck of the woods, our, our people, are now leaving us. I believe Saul was afraid. If he didn't step up and stop these people now, they were done. The Jewish people would be history. And so with these threats, he was going to destroy anybody 
of the way. And so with the authority of the high priest in Jerusalem, he gets a note and he goes to Damascus to kill those who are followers of the way. But as he goes, we just read, to kill these followers of the way, he encounters the way. And for three days, he did not eat. In fact, he did not drink. I don't know how this man survived three days without having any water. And he was, of course, blind. And so as his buddies take him to Damascus, to who knows what was going to happen next. Like, I mean, put yourself into Saul's shoes, right? You're, you're on a mission to get Israel back in control, and now you're blind and you have to be led. And you can't even eat or drink because he's obviously been impacted by this encounter. But as he's on his way, God encounters another man. If you want to hit the next slide, we're going to pick up where we left off in verse 9. And this is verse 10. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he has seen a vision of a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him, so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done for your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry the name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. And so Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized and taking food, he was Strengthen. Man. This, this man had an encounter with God. Now, I have no clue. We don't know a whole lot about Ananias in the Bible. It doesn't say a whole lot about him. I have no idea if he had encountered God many times before this or what God has actually told him in the past. But this much we know, he had an encounter with God previously because when God spoke to him, he knew it was the Lord. He had a relationship. He had encounters with God. He was a follower of the way. But I don't care how many times you've had an encounter with God. When somebody tells you, especially God, that you are to go to somebody's house and there is the murderer who has the letter from the high priest, he has all authority to destroy you, I would be freaked out. And I don't believe Ananias' response here was one of like, God, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm questioning your authority. I don't believe you. There's no way. He simply asked, God, are you not sure this is like maybe the wrong decision? Um, we know that he has authority from the high priest. In fact, everybody in the city is hiding right now who's a follower of the way because we know that if we are out anywhere and he sees us, we're going to be thrown in prison and then, like Stephen, we're going to be killed. We're going to be murdered. That's his intent. I would be freaked out. But then God says, this man, who is now a murderer of the way, is going to become a martyr of the way. He's going to, in fact, bring not only the good news to the Israelites that are in our sphere. This goes back to Acts 1.8, right? You will be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. 
That's this man. He's going to lead the charge of Acts 1.8. He's going to take this gospel that has been just kind of to this little area of really Judea, and he's going to bring it to the ends of the earth. And in fact, he sure did. He got it to Rome, which at that time was definitely the ends of that influential area. That was it. Rome would take it and expand it to the ends of the earth. And it was all because Ananias had an encounter with God and immediately he responded. After he questioned God and asked, are you sure this is right? Because I don't want to walk into that house and be the first one to be killed. <laughs> like, that sounds really awesome. But he went. And because of Ananias, this murder of the way becomes a martyr. And because of Ananias, he became the catalyst to bring the gospel around the earth. And in that moment where he walked up to Saul and he laid his hands on him and he prayed for him to be healed, he was healed and immediately he was baptized. And we know from that moment on, if you continue to read in the book of Acts, Saul was on a tear to proclaim God's word. There was nothing that was going to keep him back from spreading the good news of Jesus. And so this encounter not only affected Paul or Ananias, but it, it affected us today. An encounter with God will transform you and the world around you. Transform. You can go to the next slide because the question then is, how do we get this encounter? So today I want to answer two questions because this is, this is a great story, but we have, to, we have to put some feet to this story because it's great, it's encouraging, it's like this can happen, but this can't just happen for some people. This has to happen for all people. That's why Jesus came. Jesus came so that all men and women might be saved. That's his desire. That's his desire. So how can every single person in here encounter God? The first question that we might ask is, how do I know if I've encountered God? How do I know? Because honestly, there's probably not a single person in here today who's going to have an encounter like Saul had, right? Or like Ananias had. I would love to have had that that blinding light come and cause me to go blind and can't hardly hear because I'm, it's so deafening. I would love to have had Ananias' experience where he's having this direct conversation like it seemed as if it was a vocal conversation with God. But I haven't had that encounter. Maybe you have. I know people who have had that encounter. I know people who have seen visions of God, have experienced God so real but that's not me. Maybe that's not you. For me, I've encountered God having just this sense of peace. If you've ever had a troubling time, you're going through difficulties, I've had peace, I've had joy, I've had hope, and I'm not a man of crying, but I was bawling my eyes out because when I got into the presence of God, it took me from this stone-cold, stoic Norwegian, some German, into a puddle of emotions. I've experienced God where I've had this sense of awe, like you just know that God is there. And I can't explain it other than you're in this kind of awe or like some people call it a fear of God, but you're not afraid. It's like you're in the presence of a really good father. Mm. It's a good feeling. It's a good fear. I've had confidence in a difficult situation when I've been just strapped and I don't know what to do and I gain that confidence, I gain clarity, I gain a calling or a direction in, in difficult times. These are what I've experienced. But here's the thing. Just like Saul's encounter was different than mine, just like Ananias's encounter was different than mine, your encounter is going to be different for you. And here's the reason why. God created every single one of us different. There's not a single person in here who God relates to exactly the same. 
And that's tough as Christians, right? Because we like to have everything so systematized. Like, in America, it's like, this is how you get to the pinnacle of success. You do this, you do this, you do this, and now you're here. But in God's kingdom, he connects to each of us so vastly different. And so how I connect to God will be different than how you connect to God. And so that's important. But the problem is, is that we're too busy to take the time to encounter God. Or we're so so full of issues or things going on around us that we can't even focus on God because we're so strapped with things that are going on inside. And so how do we break this? How do we get to the point where we're not too busy or we're not too full of stuff on the outside in this world that keep us from God? Because we know the enemy doesn't want us to connect, right? The enemy of our soul is going to do everything possible to keep us from having this connection with God. He doesn't want to have an encounter between us and God. And so how do we get connected to God? There's a lot more than the ones I list today. But this is a good beginning. First, get into a silent environment. Get into a silent environment. Now, I personally, I love to connect to God through a variety of different ways, right? I like to be outside where I'm in God's creation, and I really connect to God there. I love to connect to God when I'm active, moving, doing stuff. But there is something about when I want to encounter God, I cannot have any distractions around me. If I have anything, even if I'm outside, this sounds really crazy, but if I'm outside in a beautiful beautiful nature that God has created, I'll see a squirrel, or I'll see a bird, and I'll be like, who what's that? And it immediately takes my mind off of Jesus. And so I encourage you, wherever that silent environment is, there was a popular movie uh, about two years ago called War Room. If you've ever seen it, it was a pretty good show. I liked it. One of the best Christian shows that I've ever seen, in fact. But it all had this this little closet that this lady made where it was her prayer closet. And it got really popular around America. People all of a sudden started creating their little war rooms everywhere. And, and it was a great, great thought because it's very accurate. It was a, a very small, I mean, couldn't be much more than just that little corner over there where she went in, walked in, and just spent time connecting with God. That's what we need, a little area where we connect. At church, I love to go there on the morning time, right when I wake up, and I go there because my mind's fresh. I'm clear of all the distractions, and I just, it's a nice silent place where there's nothing there going on, and I connect with God. This is a great environment to do that with. That's why it's a sanctuary. It's a, it's a set-apart place where you and God connect. So get a silent environment. Give plenty time. This is crucial because if you come in to your silent time where you're trying to connect with God like me, you come with burdens. I shared that already. I have a boatload of burdens that when I walk into the presence of God on any given day, I walk in there and I have the thoughts of work going on in my mind. Now, I'm a pastor, yes, but I do work outside of the church. And church is tough. People have bad things going on and then it takes my mind and it gets it off of Jesus. And I need to be connected with Jesus if I'm going to help anybody. And so I spend time right away, give myself at least a half hour. I know this is going to seem really tough for some people because time is not always on your side. I give myself a half hour to release my burdens to God. Whatever it might be. It could be a family member. It could be work. It could be, it, I mean, the list goes on and on right? Like the burdens that you carry, and I just give it to God, the concerns that I'm dealing with, and I just say, God, here they are. Here's my heart. Here's what's bugging me. Here's why I'm ticked off. Here's why I'm angry. Here's why I'm sad, and I let them have it. Some days are longer than others because I got a little bit more burdens on me, but that's what I need to do. Get rid of the distractions, that darn phone that so many of us are addicted to. That needs to get out because a moment that thing goes off, your brain is again distracted. 
So whatever causes you distractions, get it out of there. Get the burdens out. Give God those. And then intentionally focus on God. Nothing else. Not God, what direction do I need to go? Not God, what do you need me to do? No, just total focus on God. Give God glory. Worship him. Praise him. Thank him for what he's done in your life. Just give him all the attention and praise he deserves. If you need to, Pick up your Bible, start reading your Bible, and start focusing on some of the things that God has. Uh, Psalms are, are an amazing one to, to pick up and start reading, and just focus on a piece of Scripture that focuses on God, and start worshiping Him. And when you start giving Him attention, your burdens are released, distractions are gone, you're going to connect to God. You're going to connect to God. But then... We need to do something, right? Because I've read the Bible through many times, and I'm sure most of you have as well, or given a, a good chunk of your time. And it, as many times as I've read the Bible, I've never seen a person encounter God where he doesn't require something. When we encounter God, it demands that we respond. Right? It's the whole uh, James thought, right? James 2.26, faith without works is dead. We need to have a response to God. If it's alive, if it's going to make a difference in our life and in the lives around us, we must respond when God encounters us. Because he's going he's gonna to put something on your heart. He's going to reveal things. He's going to open you up. And we need to respond. Because when we draw near to God, he will draw near to us. It's a promise from James 4, 8. And so he's asking us, asking us. When we encounter him, will you do this? Will you do this? A.B. Simpson, he's a popular guy who kind of was alongside the AG for a long time, way back in the day when this Christian Missionary Alliance formed. And he said, all that God requires of us is an opportunity to show what he can do. He's, he's going to encounter you, and he's waiting Will you respond? Will you respond? Will you? The reality is, is we're going to fail, though, right? We've possibly, each of us in here, have encountered God. Maybe he's spoken to us. He's given us an opportunity to do something pretty amazing, like Ananias. Like, God gave Ananias a call. He responded, and God used him to transform the world all around the all around him, even into today, because he responded. But sometimes we make a mistake. In the book of Exodus, we have a perfect example of this. Exodus chapter 3 and chapter 4, you go back and read it for yourself another time. I'll save you uh, a few minutes today so that we can get done close to noon. And in chapter 3, I'll summarize it for you. God calls out to Moses in the burning bush. Now remember, Moses got there because he kind of oopsied, right? He was raised in this beautiful, beautiful palace. He was an Israelite in Egypt. He was supposed to be dead. His parents saved him by putting him out, and then all of a sudden Pharaoh's daughter sees him, brings him into her house, and raises him up. And then one day he sees one of the Egyptians beating up one of his fellow Israelites kills him, finds out the next day that everybody knows about it, flees, runs for his life, and now he's with his father-in-law, and he's in the desert doing not a whole lot other than watching sheep. God speaks to him through the burning bush, like, that's an encounter. Can't imagine how that must have been when he <laughs> hears something going on and he sees this bush burning, and then the voice of God comes booming out. And God gives him the, 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 the massive call. Like, he encounters God. God says, you are going to be the man that leads Israel out of Egypt into the promised land. And he gives him this massive, beautiful call. And then in verse 10 of chapter 4, I'll just read this very short passage for you. But Moses said to the Lord, oh man, I've done this before. <laughs> I bet everybody has. He said to the Lord, oh my Lord, 
I'm not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I'm slow of speech and of tongue. People say he had speech impediment, whatever. And the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seen or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. Okay, Moses was like God, kind of like Ananias, right? Uh, you know Saul's out to kill us. God, you know that I can't speak very well. I don't know if I'm the right guy for you. God corrects him, gets him back onto what he's supposed to do. Man, it's not going well. Moses said, oh, my Lord, please send someone else. Then the anger of the Lord kindled against Moses, and he said, now, the anger of the Lord. Now, the anger of the Lord in the Old Testament is a little bit more intense, intense yes. It's, it's not good. Um, usually when the anger of the Lord came, so did death, like right after, you know. You don't see too many times where God said, I'll give you a second chance. But this is exactly a, a, like, a, I would say, a precursor of what Jesus brings us, right? Like this is grace and mercy, like, exploding in the Old Testament. And he said, Is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Behold, he is coming out to meet you, and when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth and will teach you both what to do. That is good stuff. That should give every single person in here today hope. God's not done. If you said no in the past, you failed, you missed an opportunity, or maybe today you missed an opportunity, that doesn't say that you will never be used by God again. He's going to get you up tomorrow morning, and he's going to say, one more time, I've called you. If I've called you, I will equip, I will use you. I will equip you, and you are going to be a tool that's going to be a mighty fortress for me. If you encounter God, he requires a response. And so today, I don't know, you guys have a closing song that you do? If you want to, I think this is an awesome opportunity for us just to connect to God. I know, I'm sorry, I didn't speak this beforehand. I should have. But this today is an opportunity for you during this time you can just sing whatever song you sang before. It doesn't matter. They're all good. They all praise Jesus. That's the main thing. Have you encountered God? That's question number one that we have to answer today. And if you haven't, worshiping is a perfect opportunity to connect to God. Clear your mind of all the words that are up on the screen or anything that's going on around us and just connect to God. Let him speak to you. And if he doesn't speak to you right now, that's perfectly fine. Don't lose that spirit of God. Speak to me. I want to worship you. I want to connect with you. Whatever you have for me to do, I want to do it. And then respond because as C.S. Lewis said, it's up on the screen, the more we let God take us over, the more truly ourselves we become. So continue to press into him. We're not where we need to be. That's okay. But keep pressing in to where he has for you. Do not relent. Do not give up because God is going to bless you and use you if you're open. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you that, again, we don't have to have a room full of people to connect with you, to worship you, to experience you, God. You are speaking today, and to those who are hearing the words that are spoken, God, may they penetrate deep into their spirit, God. It's not my words, it's your words. In fact, God, what words are heard and interpreted in that person right now, God, is exactly what you want them to hear, and I pray you would encourage them and build them up today. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.